Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine brought to you by AACC and the Clinical Chemistry Trainee Council. View this and many more pearls as well as other free educational material at traineecouncil.org. Hello, my name is Matthew Carrison. I'm an Associate Medical Director for the Blood Center of Wisconsin, now part of Versity. Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on hemovigilance, a quality tool for blood transfusion. The word hemovigilance is derived from the combination of the Greek word hema, or blood, and the Latin word vigilance, or watchful. Hemovigilance began in earnest in Japan in 1993 and France in 1994 as a reaction to the events that transpired in the 1980s and early 1990s when HIV was first defined as a viral agent that could be transmitted by blood transfusion. While several definitions now exist for the modern term hemovigilance, the one to be used for the sake of discussion today is the one now used by the International Hemovigilance Network. The definition, hemovigilance, is a set of surveillance procedures covering the whole transfusion chain intended to collect and assess information on unexpected or undesirable effects resulting from therapeutic use of labile blood products and to prevent their occurrence or recurrence. The basic unit of hemovigilance is the blood transfusion chain. As shown in the figure, an adequate hemovigilance system must be able to account for and monitor all processes that lead to patient blood transfusion. The interlinked and dependent steps in the chain include the process of blood collection, including donor monitoring safety, blood component preparation, or the creation of the common blood components from whole blood, such as red blood cells, platelets, and plasma, blood testing for quality and infectious diseases, blood issuing from the donor center to the hospital and from the hospital transfusion service to the patient, blood transport from the donor service to the hospital and from the hospital transfusion service to the patient, blood administration and monitoring, and hospital physician decision-making. Hemovigilance is an important part of a quality management system in healthcare. It exists at three levels. One, the blood collector and hospital, two, regional or national levels, and three, international levels. At all three levels, the system is structured to observe, record, report, and analyze anything that goes wrong in the blood transfusion chain as noted in the previous slide. Perhaps more importantly, the system is only effective when it can use the lessons learned to take action to avoid future problems. Recognition of the importance of sharing lessons learned led to, in 2008, the development of the International Surveillance of Transfusion Associated Reaction and Events Database, ISTARE. As of 2016, 23 countries have hemovigilance systems that report data into ISTARE. In all hemovigilance systems, there is a reliance on the donor centers or hospital systems to accurately record data into a central database repository. Consequently, systems such as these are all challenged to overcome a number of hurdles to be informative and successful. While we will be unable to describe in this brief lecture all of the solutions to these issues, it is important to realize that hemovigilance systems are often limited by, one, significant delays in the submission and reporting of system data, two, limited captured detail regarding reported adverse events, three, an inability of the system to be flexible enough to capture new or evolving problems, four, data entry errors, five, limited institutional participation, and six, limited resources, including financial or staffing such that the system cannot feasibly capture and report what is expected or promised. Despite these challenges, it is now well accepted that national hemovigilance programs can and do impact patient safety. One of the best examples of this comes from the United Kingdom's Serious Hazards of Transfusion Program, or SHOT. Specifically, a serial review of reported cases of transfusion-related acute lung injury, or trolley, from 1996 to 2003, demonstrated the risk was greatest after receiving plasma-rich blood components. 
they specifically found that there was a seven to eight-fold increased risk for trolley when receiving plasma or platelets, which is often stored in essentially 100% plasma compared to red cells. Moreover, female donors are more often implicated in these cases. Because of these observations, blood services in the United Kingdom introduced risk-reducing strategies, such as the move to all male donors for fresh frozen plasma in 2003, and the preferential recruitment of male apheresis platelet donors. Newly recruited female platelet donors also were screened for antibodies to human leukocyte antigens, or HLA, and human neutrophil antigens, or HNA, and retested after pregnancies. With the introduction of these strategies, the number of reported trolley cases were shown to decrease from a peak of 36 suspected cases and 7 deaths in 2003 to 11 suspected cases and no deaths in 2012. As I alluded to earlier, many countries around the world now have organized transfusion hemovigilance systems. As you can see on this slide, countries in Europe, Asia, Africa, and North America now have hemovigilance systems that produce written reports and have public websites such that data can be viewed and shared by others. For the remainder of this lecture, I will now turn our focus to the United States. Hemovigilance in the United States is truly a highly complex patchwork of separate mandatory and voluntary reporting processes. At the national level, only fatal transfusion reactions, donation-related deaths, and product deviations discovered after distribution are required to be reported by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. This requirement is mandated as part of the Code of Federal Regulations. For those who are unfamiliar with the term, biological product deviations in transfusion medicine relate to manufactured blood products that are in violation of a rule, standard, or specification. These events are reported publicly as annual reports and can be found on the FDA's website. A representative table from the 2017 annual report is shown on this slide. This table shows the reported number and proportion of deaths from transfusion by etiology from 2013 to 2017. Hopefully, you can see from this table that in 2017, the most commonly reported cause of transfusion-related mortality in the U.S. was from transfusion-associated cardiac overload, or TACO. Unfortunately, the reporting of other adverse events from transfusion, such as non-fatal donor and patient reactions, and errors that do not lead to product deviations, are not required in the U.S. As a result, clinically useful findings, such as those produced by the SHOT system in the United Kingdom, cannot be currently obtained via a single formal hemovigilance system in the U.S. That said, voluntary national reporting systems, however, are available for those who wish to participate. In 2010, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, began managing the National Healthcare Safety Network, or NHSN, hemovigilance module, a free, voluntary, passive surveillance system. This database serves as the only national surveillance platform for recipient hemovigilance that is available for use by all U.S. healthcare facilities performing transfusions and capture standardized data on reaction type, including the transfusion-transmitted infections, procedure errors, and near-miss events. Data entered into the system may be voluntarily shared by facilities with external partners for patient safety improvement initiatives and to fulfill reporting mandates. Enrollment has steadily increased from 82 facilities in 2010 to 277 facilities in 2016 of the estimated 4,600 facilities in the United States, with mandatory reporting required for all 69 facilities in the state of Massachusetts. In order to compare adverse events between sites, all aspects of the data elements reported by each site into the database should be as similar and uniform as possible. To account for these interpretive differences, the NHSN created specific terms and definitions that were vetted by subject matter experts to be used by all sites. As an example, for transfusion reactions, 12 different specific diagnostic entities were defined with specific case definition criteria. Additionally, respondents are required to determine reaction severity, or how medically critical the reaction symptoms were, and imputability 
or how likely the transfusion was actually the cause of the symptoms. As the number of NHSN participating sites continues to increase, the clinical utility of the database continues to improve. In 2015, Harvey et al. identified the frequency and severity of reported adverse events from only 77 participating sites over two years and found that the proportion and frequency of reported adverse events in the U.S. to be comparable to that reported in other countries with larger hemovigilance networks. In 2019, Has et al. used the data from 195 sites over six years to evaluate characteristics of transfusion-transmitted infections within the U.S. With this much larger sample size, they were able to highlight rare events, such as babesiosis and bacterial infections from older age, day four and day five platelets that represent current challenges to the safety of the blood supply. NHSN is not the only option for hemovigilance monitoring in the U.S. The AABB Patient Safety Organization, or PSO, sponsored a Center for Patient Safety up until this year and provided participating hospitals a similar mechanism to NHSN by which adverse transfusion events could be reported and monitored. Additionally, a separate AABB donor hemovigilance program allows blood collection centers to report and monitor donation-related adverse events using the Donor Hemovigilance Analysis and Reporting Tool, or Donor Heart. As of 2014, nine U.S. blood centers and three hospital blood banks participated in this reporting effort. Lastly, monitoring of emerging infectious diseases, non-infectious complications of transfusion, and donation-related reactions have been performed by investigator-led collaborative research initi initiatives and include independent efforts by the American Red Cross, Blood Systems Research Institute, and the National Institutes of Health, to name a few. It is difficult to see what the future holds for national hemovigilance in the United States, but it is quite clear the value it holds for the transfusion medicine community. While it does not seem likely that reporting of non-fatal adverse events will become a nationally required activity in the near future, state governments may play a key role in improving participation in critical hemovigilance activities. For instance, in partnership with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, all licensed blood banks in the state of Massachusetts, as of June 2014, were required to report events to the NHSN. Given the published success of this partnership, Massachusetts represents one example whereby adverse events monitoring could be systematically improved and regulated. Other than that, the future success of national hemovigilance monitoring remains up to us. Through dissemination of knowledge, such as through this pearl, it is my hope that all hospitals will see value in this effort and will volunteer to participate in these important monitoring activities. In conclusion, hemovigilance plays a critical quality function at both local and national levels. National hemovigilance efforts, in particular, can be incredibly helpful to public health, as has been seen by the efforts of the SHOT network in the United Kingdom to reduce the risk of trolley. Unfortunately, U.S. national hemovigilance efforts has lagged behind other countries and even today consists of a patchwork of disparate national reporting processes. A key challenge for these networks moving forward is increasing the number of voluntary participants and improving awareness regarding the critical importance of these systems. That said, the data captured in these systems are growing each year and are beginning to produce important data that can inform future domestic transfusion initiatives and improve blood safety. Thank you for joining me on this pearl of laboratory medicine on hemovigilance, a quality tool for blood transfusion. For more like this, as well as articles, podcasts, and more, please visit the Trainee Council at traineecouncil.org.